Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture on a special day. This is International Women's Day 2017. Uh, we at NIH greatly benefit uh, from the remarkable contributions of women who make up more than half of our workforce here in Bethesda and who give of their talents, their brains, their hearts, uh, their dedication in ways that contribute immeasurably to making this place a really remarkable institution uh, with a noble mission. So it is particularly appropriate, therefore, that on this particular Wednesday afternoon, uh, the lecture is sponsored uh, by uh, the Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers. And the speaker uh, is a distinguished professor uh, uh, who is also going to talk to us about some very interesting science, but who by her own career is an example of how women can shape entire fields uh, by the way in which their creativity uh, creates new opportunities and new ideas. Carla Pugh, who is our speaker today, uh, is currently the professor of surgery and the Susan Behrens Professor of Surgical Education, as well as being vice chair of education and patient safety at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she's also a professor of industrial and systems engineering in the College of Engineering. So you can imagine that's uh, an awful lot of portfolios to be juggling. And as you hear her speak, you'll begin to see how it all fits together. Uh, Carla got her undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley uh, with a BA in neurobiology. Uh, subsequently obtained her MD uh, from Howard, uh, not far from here and then obtained a PhD in education at Stanford University School of Education. Uh, she was on the faculty at Stanford uh, for a couple of years and then went to Northwestern uh, where she was assistant professor of education and associate professor uh, of education as well as of surgery. And then since 2012, for the last five years, uh, she's been at the University of Wisconsin with the titles uh, that I mentioned to you and covering a broad range of capabilities and skills. Uh, she is uh, a talented individual recognized in 2011 uh, by a PCASE award. If you don't know what that is, that's the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, a highly prestigious award which is chosen nationally and which we at NIH are always glad when we see uh, somebody that we've helped train and support are recognized in that way. And she is one of that small and very distinguished group. We're proud to also uh, count her amongst our grantees as she has been co-investigator and consultant in several NIH grants. Uh, the work she's going to talk to you about involves ways in which sensors and motion tracking can be utilized uh, to try to optimize the performance of physicians, turning them into elite athletes, as she has said. Because after all, being a, a skillful physician requires you both uh, to have the intellectual skills uh, the empathetic approach to patients, and oftentimes also uh, technical skills, which may be more difficult to assess uh, than many of the other things that we test people on. I recently spent a little time with Atul Gawande, who, as you know, is a remarkable writer, but also an endocrine surgeon in Boston. And he told me this has been an issue he's been concerned about. He actually has a coach that comes into the OR and watches him uh, carry out uh, particularly delicate surgical procedures and gives him feedback about whether his technical performance uh, was what it should be. And that sounds wonderful, but I don't think that scales very well. <laughs> and, and if we're serious about trying to optimize the technical capabilities of medical students, residents, and even full professors, uh, there may be other ways to do this. And from my reading of a little bit of what I've seen of what Carla has done and which she will no doubt tell us more about here today, uh, this kind of technology might be just what we need. So her talk is Sensors, Motion Tracking, and Data Science, the Quest to Train MDs Like Elite Athletes. Please join me in welcoming to the podium uh, Dr. Carla Pugh. Thank you so much. Greetings. My fellow scientists, I am so excited to be here. I can't uh, express all of the thoughts and emotions that I've had uh, during my visit today, but I was sure that I was going to continue to be speechless because this is 
such a humbling uh, experience and an honor. And soon after I declared that I was going to be speechless the whole day, we started talking about science. And I haven't stopped talking ever since. So I will continue uh, in that manner. And before I really get into the details of the research that you all have supported me in doing, I wanted to share with you the first time that I met Richard Nakamura. And I'm not sure if he's here today, but I am a permanent member of the BTSS study section for NIBIB, and he paid us a visit during our last meeting. And the words that he shared were both powerful and inspirational. He thanked us for our service, and we wanted to thank him in the middle of his speech for his service. And at the end of him sharing his thoughts with us, we all felt a deep honor and privilege in being able to work together towards the scientific agenda here in our great country. And so I just wanted to thank him for his kind and thoughtful words. We were all inspired. And um, I don't think anyone on the study section that day will forget his visit. By way of disclosure, some of the technology that I will share with you today is technology I developed when I was a graduate student uh, at Stanford. And I have uh, a few patents. Uh, others pending, a license agreement and consulting and royalty fees with a simulation company, but I do not accept research dollars uh, for uh, the work that I do in this area from those companies. My agenda is pretty straightforward. It's embedded in my title. I will share with you today some of the work that we've done in our laboratory using sensors and the data that it produces to understand how we can move forward in a strong agenda relating to physician performance. I will also talk about motion tracking, which is my latest endeavor, and how data science connects all of the technology that you could possibly use for this purpose. What does this mean? Why on earth would you want to train a physician like an elite athlete? We know what athletes do. They have coaches. They spend a fair amount of time with physical training, cognitive training. And then there's even quality oversight, both during and after uh, their game. But this is the reason. This is my strong argument today. It's the data. The data that has continuously driven the training process for well over 60 years. We know the data, we cite their stats, they know their competitors' data, they know their data, and at the end of the day, it guides the coaches, and it also motivates the players from a perspective of personal goal setting. It also gives us a measure in terms of a standard of excellence. Now there's a lot of commonalities, but I think the most interesting one, and the one that drives my passion for the research, is that once you're finished medical school, and once you've finished your residency, the concept of training is lost on the physician that is currently in practice, and I think that we should change that. What's really exciting is the new technologies that are available for, for athletes in their training. This is a snapshot of video footage from the Federer Murray Olympic match in London. And the video enabled the capture of ball movement data. So the red dots are where the ball landed and the green lines are where the ball was hit. 
afterwards. Now this looks a little cluttered and you wondered how you could do any analysis from this. This is the full data. So the red and purple lines are where Federer and Murray, their movement and where their shots were, and the green and blue lines are where the ball was hit. And this is very interesting that you could capture their game with dots and lines. Looks like our basic science work here. Then you can actually even look at a subset of the data. So these are the winning shots, the winning shot positions and the movement. So it looks like Federer was doing a whole lot of movement during this game. However, Murray had more winning shots and subsequently won this uh, game. What I find even more fascinating that's happening this exact week as we stand here, there is a sports analytics conference taking place. A partnership between MIT and ESPN. Fantastic. Gives me some more goals to shoot for. And so it's great to have all this really cool data, but are there any, any training benefits? I think we know there are. Uh, coaches now have more data than they could ever imagine to plan and strategize and put together a training program. Look at this data. The purple dots are the successful shots that Kobe made. Think about it. His players know where his sweet spot is. He knows where it is. And if you want to win the game, you had better help Kobe get to that spot so he can make the shot. Increases the odds. This is how you use data. Similarly, every sport that you can think of has data that can help the coach and the player. What's exciting is that IBM is interested. You know, we've got Watson and they are partnering in the healthcare field um, and looking at medical data. Their initial focus is on the patient, which makes a whole lot of sense. There's a whole lot of data there. But the question that has fueled my work is what happens when you capture data from practicing physicians? What happens? So this takes me back to the beginning where I began to think about this as a resident of my surgical training. And I played sports when I was in high school, and I fully expected that when I got to my surgical training that after every operation I would have some data. Little disappointed, but uh, not bewildered. I said, well, great, I'm going to go find out how we can get data. And so I went back to school to get a PhD in education and took classes on human computer interactions. And that's where I learned about sensor technology and it has changed my life. While I was sitting in those classes with my engineering colleagues, I thought about all of my experiences in the medical field, from basic physical exams to complex operations and how can we get the data such that no other surgeon in training or in practice would ever practice their craft without having continuous feedback on how to be the best that they can be. So I started at the beginning. I started with simulators, mannequin parts, and I put sensors anywhere that I could. This is actually for those of you who are not OBGYN physicians, which I suspect the majority the picture on the top is a uterus and a cervix, and then the other one is a cervix piece, and the other one is a, on below is actually a uh, uterus with fibroids. And so it was exciting for me to, to take apart these models and figure out how to put sensors on them. And you can see how long ago this was. I, of course, I was only five when I did this research. Um, uh, but you could see this interface. I mean, this was before cell phone apps. This is, you could, we built an interface that showed where someone was touching and with how much pressure. And one day when I was preparing the, the final simulator for a class project, uh, two students said, Dr. Pugh, what are you doing? I had sensors all over the place, quad op amps and wires, and I said, I'm 
you know, I'm finalizing a, a simulator I built for the pelvic exam uh, for a class project. And they said, well, can we use it? Can you teach us? And up until that point, I hadn't really thought about how I would use the simulator with students. Um, I was really focused on showing that the sensors worked and, and understanding how to use the data. But what I did was go back to my native roots. I know how to teach them when I'm in the clinic. So I stood there and I watched them do an exam on the, on the model, but I didn't let them see the computer screen because none of our patients have a computer and I wasn't sure how this would affect their learning. But this is the full system. They both began to do an exam and if I had to give them a grade based on what I saw as I watched them, I would have given them the same grade. They were incredibly smart. They were articulate about what they were doing. Their posture was right. And when I looked at the computer screen, it was night and day. One student was doing a fair number of high level palpations on the fundus of the uterus. And I should orient you, this is the amount of pressure over time. This is really hurts because it's the sampling rate of the sensors. And each of these different colors represent a different area of the anatomy. And this person held constant pressure on the left posterior part of the cervix and applied several deep palpations to the fundus. Very different exam. And this person was barely touching anything except for the cervix. And that's when I knew that there was something here, something that we could potentially do with this data and I remained curious. I then applied for a dissertation grant and I was awarded uh, additional research dollars to collect more data. I had already collected data from um, all of the medical students at Stanford, so this was an opportunity to go to the American College of OBGYN, which happened to be in San Francisco that year. And the physicians lined up. They were so proud, they said, oh, this is fantastic you definitely want my exam in your database because I'm the best. I said, fantastic. And if you have any other colleagues who are good, send them our way. And in four days, we collected data from over 300 physicians. We had also collected more data from students, and this is their average data over two simulators. Students spend about 65 seconds during the exam. Um, average of five uh, pressure units, and that was relating to the sensors we were using, and frequency in terms of hertz and the number of areas they touch. Clinicians spent half the time, less pressure, less frequency in terms of the number of times they needed to touch each area, and they were more accurate. Again, this is very exciting um, in terms of me understanding that this data can tell some things that we hadn't understood before. Again, we call this a physical exam registry, but as I think back about these studies, what was even equally exciting is that these are practicing physicians. They lined up to be tested. They wanted the feedback. And the more and more I think about it, having given 100 talks on this topic and everyone says, well, how do the doctors feel being tested? And in general, in my mind, I always say, yeah, they're not lining up to do it. Well, they're not lining up for the American Board of Medical Specialties group to test them because the testing in that group is really high stakes. But in this venue where they felt comfortable, they lined up. And that's the epiphany that um, I've had recently regarding this in terms of how do we infiltrate this data in give feedback to physicians. They really do want it. I also think this is a data science opportunity. And when I think about my the conceptual dream that I had in terms of giving physicians this feedback, this is what it would look like. You know, I knew, I systematically fabricated these models such that the angulation of the uterus was different in the abdomen. And I knew that that actually affected accuracy. And it was my dream at that time as a graduate student to be able to correlate someone's individual performance with a large database of people and how that changes according to the patient's anatomy. This was my dream. 
I then use this data to apply um, for a similar grant with the National Board of Medical Examiners. And this was really exciting, having an opportunity to work with their psychometricians and learn what was meaningful in this data. They convened a two-day task force uh, to look at the data and came to uniform agreement in terms of clinical scenarios and pass fail criteria that they would be interested uh, in modeling and using uh, for the licensing exam. And this was a this was an intellectual exercise that really informed me in terms of how to use the data. And it was pretty rewarding because if you think about where we were and still are right now, checklists are the gold standard in terms of how we assess clinical skills performance. And my goal was to be able to put sensors on that mannequin and give you feedback in terms of the quality, the real quality of your chest compressions. And if you're really wanting to get good chest compressions and you see that that's where your force is, then I think we can help you do better. And some of this technology is only now starting to uh, infiltrate uh, some of the world of simulation and even some of our medical devices. What was exciting was to be able to back up this dream uh, and to do a study where we compared the sensor data with checklist data and showed, as well as the student's assessment of the various models we presented, and showed that there was significant correlation between what we see in the sensor data and the current gold standard with checklists and what they are writing on their clinical documentation form. In my first faculty position, I then applied for more money to collect more data. And I went to the American Urologic Association with a, a digital rectal exam model, and the same thing happened. They lined up hundreds of urologists to be tested, and they wanted the feedback. Meanwhile, I was also I was doing double duty with the simulator. I was also using it as a teaching tool. Uh, my strong interest was assessment in the data, but as a teaching tool, it was actually quite interesting to see the students looking at the computer while they're learning the exam and auto-correcting without needing feedback from a faculty member. One of the things we discovered was there was a lot that was lost in translation when the students go from reading what they're supposed to do in a textbook and then actually trying to do it. And the data showed that the students had a misconception of how to do the exam. If this is a cross-section of the prostate gland, most of the students misunderstood how to do the exam and they only twisted their finger in the median raffe of the prostate and most of them never touched the lateral lobes and missed lesions there. So we were able to correct them right away uh, with the simulator and the immediate visual feedback. Again, we collected data from hundreds of urologists, colorectal surgeons, and students, and we had a model that was had subtle findings. This model had benign prostatic hypertrophy and had 180 degrees. Um, there was a soft but fairly sizable three centimeter mass in the rectum. And it was interesting to find that the urologists, 50% of them, never supinate their finger in the rectum, so they miss this rectal cancer. And that was obviously a different type of inspiration for me because I thought, wow, so I've always thought about using this as a teaching tool and for training and setting standards, but how about the patient who goes to their internist and they have some urinary or other complaints and then their doctor defers the digital rectal exam because they don't want them to have to have this uncomfortable exam twice. And then they go to a specialist only to find that the specialist only does one part of the exam. And I thought, wow, this is quite interesting. This is tracking practice patterns. Huge opportunities from another a data science opportunity. And so then I started to dream about that. You know, capturing uh, data, independent variables from all of the physicians. How many um, weeks are you in terms of your uh, clinical practice from 
your residency, what region do you practice, how many exams do you do per year, and how does that affect what type of examination you do? One look through the data it was mostly the younger physicians who didn't do a full exam. And so that was quite interesting. But it's a simulator, so getting to how do you apply data from a simulation to data in real clinical practice. Um, nevertheless, folks were excited about it and we received an award from the Association for Surgical Education. And obviously every time you get an award that just fuels you to keep going with the research. So we were very excited about this. Um, but it did encourage us to collect more data and encourage us to look deeper into the data. What do these measures mean in terms of, of assessing performance? How do we give feedback? Uh, and how do we track uh, the practicing clinician? So I began to instrument any simulator that I could get my hands on. Uh, another example outside of physical exams, an intubation procedure, this is done commonly uh, in a elective fashion every millions of times a day for elective surgery, but also under emergent uh, circumstances by our emergency medicine uh, physicians as well as EMS, uh, a number of emergency scenarios. So we put sensors on one of the common intubation simulators. We put sensors in places where you should be touching and where the instruments should touch, and we put them in places where you shouldn't. Uh, so obviously, if you're trying to get an airway, it does not help if the endotracheal tube goes into the esophagus. But if you did it, I would know, because I have the data. So again, each of the different colors represent a different area of the anatomy. And I have to say, some of the places we place sensors were counterintuitive when you read a medical textbook, but it made perfect sense when you watched a clinician do what they do and then think about all the places they're touching. So we had a sensor on the tongue. Doesn't make any sense except for that's where the laryngoscope rests. And then I was able to see every place, how the person moved the number of times and the amount of force um, that they had uh, with the laryngoscope. And so this person took several movements of the laryngoscope, found a good, what they thought was a good spot, held good pressure, uh, but then wasn't able to get a good enough view to pass the, uh, the tube. Here they finally got the tube in, and you could see when the tip of the endotracheal tube passed the vocal cords and then the balloon went by, so there's more force there. And this is a successful intubation, and if we were left to use a checklist, they followed the steps, they got the uh, laryngoscope in and they got the tube in, except this is what an experience intubation looks like. Big difference. And what you see here is not only the difference in the amount of time it took to get the intubation, but also there are sensors that are showing up that you never even see. And this relates to extreme tilting of the neck and pressure on the teeth and all of these other things that now we definitely should be giving feedback to someone who wants to be an expert. So what do I do? I collect more data. It's very exciting. So I was asked, what about the breast exam? And I had never thought about it. I said, well, you know, it's not something that's internal. You, we can, and, and the other thing, it's actually kind of complex. Everybody does it differently. Unlimited degrees of freedom. Some people use one hand. Some people use two hands. I'm like, I don't know, but let's try it. Um, so we put several different types of sensors underneath uh, one of these models, built some tumors, built an interface, and this is what a breast exam looks like. And I thought the first question, if I'm really going to move forward with this, is can we tell the difference between two of the most commonly recommended techniques in the textbook in terms of how you should cover the breast tissue when you're palpating? And some people recommend the linear strip method and some recommend the circular method. And so I said, well, if the sensors can tell the difference with that, then maybe we're on to something. So this is what a breast exam looks like when you're doing the linear strip method. And again, each of the different colors represent a different area of the anatomy. What's interesting is that the sensor under the nipple areolar complex, you pass it several times as you're doing the exam in a linear strip fashion. So you see the yellow sensor show up um, over a longer time period compared to when you're doing the circular technique. 
If you start in the center, then it's very focused. And I said, great, you can visually uh, see the difference uh, in the data, let alone extract uh, those uh, variables. So that was exciting because then I thought, you know, this is more complex than the internal exams just because of the sheer number of different ways you can do it. And that's where we applied for an R01. And I'm excited that the study section really liked the grant and gave us a perfect score. And that's how I got the P, P case grant and came here with my family and had a fantastic day with many of you who are in, in the audience. It was just, it was fantastic for my whole team. I brought all the engineers here with me. And this is our picture. Uh, that actually, it's my picture. The other persons here are other uh, PCase awardees, which was also amazing to meet them and to learn about their research. This award gave us extra time to explore different sensors. Up until that point, we were using uh, simple FSRs that detect direct force. And the problem was I knew that there were directional forces in the data, so we partnered with uh, an engineer who does microelectrical mechanical sensors, and he developed a um, MIM sensor that detected directional forces. We were very excited about this. We put them in the models and used them with the medical students, and they broke all of them. So we had to start all over with another sensor. And this one, uh, seemed to hit the, 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 the mark in terms of being able to get not only direct force, but direction, a directional force, because it's a multiple sensors in a small matrix, and then we can just do a mathematical calculation to get the directions. So that was exciting. So we moved forward. Um, I was then able to also, with the PCASE uh, additional funds, to hire a signal processing engineer to help uh, with the data mining and data analysis. And we had a new system because I thought, you know, this is the first exam that I'm doing where I can actually see all the anatomy, at least what the people are doing with their hands. And so we added in a webcam and we synced the sensor and the video data together with this system. And there's a sensor under here. This is a simulated breast model with uh, various tumors or none. And uh, I thought, great, now we can collect some data and see what we find. So we grounded our um, R01 study in a paper that had been published over 13 years ago um, stating the recommendations for a clinical breast exam based on a number of meta-analyses that have been done um, both in the clinical world as well as on other uh, clinical breast exam models. And the recommendations was that there should be at least three different levels of pressure. And despite what's in the textbooks, the linear strip method uh, tends to cover more breast tissue and that is their recommended uh, technique to cover the breast tissue. They also said you should use the pads of your first three fingers to do the exam. So we've got force pressure sensors and so we wanted to look at what do people actually use three different levels of pressure. What was interesting, we first looked at the average and we looked at, we had, what we designed a simulator that we thought had a fairly obvious mass and we were uh, surprised to see that 16 people missed it. And I said, we've got to look and see what they did. And if you look, and then we found 16 match controls uh, in the data of, we had a, a database for over 136 physicians and most of them got it except for 16. And when you look at these 16 who did not find the mass, on average they have less than 10 newtons force. And that was interesting. So then we wanted to explore further and what we did was actually force the issue. We took that same mass and we went and collected data from 200 other physicians, different groups. We collected from surgeons, OBGYN physicians, and family practitioners. We went to their meetings, they lined up, we collected data from them. and. We not only took the same mass that we had in this study, but we cut it in half so that it would be a little more difficult to find and then see how the force uh, would vary from that perspective. This is a video of two physicians that have on average 15 years in practice. They both have a systematic approach 
However, the amount of force that they use is very different, and one of them said that there was no mass, despite having touched it a number of times. As you see, the one little bright area show up, but he didn't touch it with enough force in order to recognize that there was a mass. Our results from this study of the 550 physicians show that there is a linear or almost log linear relationship between force and accuracy. And when you're below 10 newtons, you're 70% more likely to miss a lesion. Um, above 15 newtons, you have a diminishing gain, so it doesn't mean that you should be doing 30 newton breast exams. It's, it may not help. Um, but also, these were difficult tumors, so there was not 100% accuracy. But 15% of practicing physicians that have an average of uh, 20 years in practice don't apply enough force to find a lesion during a breast exam. The other thing we found, linear does cover significantly more breast tissue, but most of the physicians don't use it. Uh, they still use the circular technique even 10 years after the study was published. And when we think about search technique, we found it interesting. They talked about using the first three fingers, but the video helped us to categorize what it was that people were actually doing with their fingertips, the kinematics, if you will, not how they covered, because they were, we were able to categorize 90% of the physicians into three groups. Some of them were rubber, some were patterns, some did piano fingers, and uh, that we had to make up terms because there was no terminology for it. And it turns out, if you use the piano fingers technique, you are 50% less likely to find a lesion. And this was fascinating to us because it was clear that this was a technique that had just been handed down by tradition. And so this was something else that was very interesting for us with the data. We published this just recently in the Annals of Surgery, um, and this was very exciting for our team as well, the highest impact journal in surgery. And in this last uh, 10 minutes of my talk, I will talk about data science and the motion tracking. And one of the things that helped us was a referral from some of our MIT colleagues to go and partner with some of the haptics, uh, scientists who work in the area of haptics. And I sent an email and I made phone calls and both, as they call her, Bobby Klatsky and Susan Letterman responded. Susan had retired. She talked to me on the phone for an hour and a half, and it was very exciting. And Dr. Klatsky came to visit our lab. And what she had us do was to actually take some of the movements that we've seen in the videos and actually do them purposefully on the sensors and see what waveform it would generate. And this was fascinating because we had never thought to do that, and it helped us to look at all of our squiggly lines in a different way, and it really motivated us in terms of going back and trying to extract more uh, information from the data we had. And we had partnered with a number of data scientists, although that wasn't a term back in those days. We used clustering algorithms, Fourier transforms, visual analytics, and each approach gave us some small different uh, look at the data, but never the full story. So I just remained um, fully intrigued at how we could pull out all of the performance variables from this data. I presented some of the work at uh, one of the scientific meetings, Medicine Meets Virtual Reality, and there was an engineer in the audience and he said, this is fantastic. Your problem is that you have a time series problem. And I said, that's fantastic, because that's not what they told me in medical school. I have no idea what that means or how to address that. But I would be happy if you would want to take my data and look at it. And he said, you know, when you look at, when you think about an EKG, cracking the code on this was, was easy because there was a repeating waveform. However, cracking the code on a random physician who does palpation and cognitively decides how he changes what he does with his fingers or the direction, there is no reoccurring pattern that you can depend upon. So that made me realize that this was uh, getting these signals and waveforms out um, and using them for performance metrics would be a little more difficult than I thought. Tried the Markov models and actually 
it was quite helpful. He was able to use uh, hidden Markov models to classify uh, what it is that experts do differently than novices and also uh, give us a sense, not pulling out these waveforms, but, all, but showing us predicting what waveform would come next. And that was quite interesting for us as well. So I'll talk a little bit about motion tracking and a little more about data science as I think I'm setting a trend and a path here that, and I'll spill the beans because I get really excited when I give these talks. Everyone has always thought that this work has been about the breast exam, the pelvic exam, the intubation. And for me, it's always been about the data. And how do we use it? How do I apply what I'm learning from the data with these simulators for practice in healthcare and physicians? I'll go quickly through this. In order to use it for, use this uh, sensor and motion tracking technology for oper surgical operations, I had to go to motion tracking because the sensors, if you cut them, then you don't get any data. So we began to build physical models, and this is an example of a laparoscopic ventral hernia simulator. It's made of cloth. Um, there are simulated organs on the inside, and because it's cloth, you can use all of the instruments that you normally use in the operating room. We instrumented the surgeons. We put sensors, uh, small sensors on their uh, fingertips and put surgical gloves. And this is a fully instrumented resident. He has um, video glasses on, audio recorder, the motion tracking gloves. We are capturing data from the laparoscopic view. There's a person standing from your point of view completing the traditional checklist. Um, and we have an external camera, as well as when they're done, the trainee does a self-assessment. And FPA is final product analysis. That's something we don't get to do with our patients. Once this resident attempts to repair the hernia, then we can take the skin off the patient and look at every detail and see how well he's done. This is a close-up uh, view of the simulator being used in another venue. But this is an example of the motion data, and you can see this is a suturing board with a student and different technology, but we tend to talk about the path length, uh, which is if you take this line, every place that there's been, if you stretch it out, that's the path length. The working volume is really sort of the area that which the path length covers, and then the smoothness has to do with your transitions from one movement to another. And this is what a laparoscopic ventral hernia looks like. And the different colors actually represent areas of acceleration just with the left hand. So I will show you this video and I can show you why combining video and motion tracking together uh, helps us to understand. This is a surgery resident who was trying to get this piece of mesh to cover the hernia, which is here having some significant issues with depth perception. And of course, I could watch the video, it takes two hours, and try and give this person feedback. It's the data that helps me go right to that point um, and shortcuts the time that I need to spend looking at videos to give them feedback. What's also been very exciting about this, we can also quantify decision making. And that was exciting for us to find, and I'll share a few uh, data points with you. What we realize is that it's not just the motion that's important when they're moving, that is their technical performance, but where there are pauses, or what we are calling idle time, that represents surgical planning, what people are thinking, um, and then how you start after you've paused or the number of times you start and restart, all of these things actually represent the cognitive um, portion of an operation. And we had never thought that we could use motion data to capture cognitive processes. So here's an example. What we realize is that idle time can actually tell the difference between an easy task and a difficult task. Um, I don't have realized the same thing I tell my researchers. I don't have, this is uh, data from 10 students 10 residents and 10 faculty. And uniformly, all of them had more idle time when they were putting three sutures in tissue paper. Putting it in foam and balloon, their perception is that they could make clear movements and not have a problem. But none of them wanted to tear the tissue paper, so they were very 
calculate it. And this was fascinating. And so this shows, this is a faculty person who was able to get three proline sutures in tissue. Um, not, not so well for the medical student. What was interesting when we looked at the details of idle time, the faculty had some idle time when they were putting the needle into the tissue, but more of their idle time was when they were tying the knots. The students had more idle time when they were putting the needle in and they didn't think to pause as much or plan when they were tying and that's when they tore the tissue. So this is fascinating. What ex exciting for me is that there's a lot of technology being developed. And so there is an endless supply of sensor data and things that we can try um, in the operating room such that it's least an invasive um, technology, um, sensor technology woven into fabric, uh, Google Glass and other types of data. Even now some of the uh, bio films that capture technology. And what's been interesting for me is initially I got nervous. You know, I was like, wow, I'm using these old fashioned sensors and now there's all of these really cool technologies I have to start over again. And in some of our preliminary analysis, people still move the same. So it's actually still not about the simulator. It's not even about the sensors. It's about the data and trying to understand how do you analyze it and what does it mean? The other thing, just thinking about the various types of simulation that we use, I'm thoughtful, you know, we use pick guts, we use fabric, we use pick feet, we use sim mannequin trainers, uh, and even uh, standardized patients that have a moulage. And these are all a wide variety of different types of simulation that we use. And when I think about it, uh, doing a case scenario or multiple case scenarios on an x-ray, that's also a simulation. So it's nothing new, it's just the term is new. And it makes me thoughtful as a researcher. For me, my goal is to use, the simulator is my bench. This is my, I mean, this is my mouse. And I can have different simulators that represent different models, but it's, and you use different reagents, different scenarios, different sensors, but it's the data that is what is helping you to move this agenda forward in the science. The simulators for me have been a controlled research environment. Um, and that helps you think differently about simulation. Uh, using it as a teaching tool, there are pros and cons. Using it as a testing tool, there are pros and cons. Using it as a research tool, I am totally biased that it's a whole lot of fun. And the goal is the data. And uh, this is also what's interesting is that there are a lot of ways um, in terms of training databases using deep learning to actually now I don't have to watch videos. I can use this type of data uh, to automatically track uh, what's happening. And um, this, you know, I'm just learning about this technology and one of my engineers uh, figured it out and I think I can show this data. He actually showed, trained this system to look at what instruments look like in a hand and he plays this in fast speed so you will see the exchange between needle driver and forceps and all he had to do was train it once and then it does it on its own. Needle driver forceps now suture and this is going fast but this and it may seem rudimentary but one thing it does is it gives me data from the right hand and the left hand, which I can correlate with the motion tracking sensors, but it also helps me segment the data because then I can know when they were tying a knot versus when they were throwing a stitch. And right now we're doing that by hand. I think in the end for me, you know, it's not clear whether we fit in the big data space. I think that we have lots of data with the video data, the motion tracking, audio, checklist, and all of these uh, different types. Definitely looking at a variety of data. The volume may not be as big as the genome, but I think that this is a new and exciting area, and I'm excited to partner with people who work in this area. The one thing that makes me thoughtful is that now you've got the IBMs and all of these other groups that are looking at sensor data analytics and we're mapping this out for every environment and my desire is to have all healthcare practitioners be a part of this.
why. And I give the example of physicians, but even a seasoned physician in a new hospital is at risk from a quality perspective. Any new physician, uh, uh, experienced physician learning a new skill poses a risk. Physicians who have, are in the military and leave and they come back and have to be reentered, they are a quality risk, as well as a new physician in a new hospital. This is my conclusion. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. The doctors want it, they line up. I have proof, I've been doing it for 17 years. Thank you. Carla, that was fantastic. Uh, and we have time for some questions. So please, if you have questions, go to the microphone so people watching by video can hear and we can start right over here. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, AJ Endome, I'm a, a surgeon myself, a neurosurgeon. Um, and it's very interesting watching all this. The, the question is, when do we get to the point where we get to be Serena or Federer and look at a video and see our performance? So, you know, a lot of us are already taking videos of the surgeries that we do, and there's been data that shows that you could tell an experienced surgeon versus an inexperienced surgeon just by watching them. Where are you as far as machine learning and being able to look at a video and look at the motion of someone's hand and tell how well they did on that case? So, the, uh I feel there's two parts to that question for me. The machine learning, the technology exists. It is finding the scientists who feel that this, the engineers who know how to do this that are partnering um, with ESPN and other groups, getting them to partner with us in the healthcare field and making it look sexy for them to do this. Um, that is the next frontier in terms of getting people to say, Yes, this, is, this data is also exciting and important. The ability to do it is there. It's now that we know this data can help us in the medical field, walking across the street and partnering uh, with those engineers so that they can partner with us. We, it, we can do this now, definitely. The second part of it is still doing some of those fundamental research experiments such that we do understand what the data means. So I think that we've had a lot of success looking at the data um, in an old fashioned way in terms of understanding how to model what it is that an expert does or the range of things that an expert does. And so I think we have that capability. Uh, it's very exciting to be able to do it more efficiently, but we do have that capability of understanding what it is that the experts do and quantifying the expert so that then we can give feedback to those who are looking to reach expertise. Thank you. Over here. Uh, I'm Ray Perez, Office of Naval Research. Uh, um, thank you, this is fascinating uh, research. Two comments uh, and a question. First question is, I'm really interested in the idle time. Have you asked the individual surgeons what they are thinking about when they're in idle time? So I have not asked them. Uh, I did do an after action review with one surgeon, although the idle time in that person was actually pretty clear. He was making a mistake and had gotten frustrated and was trying to plan the next step or how to rescue the error that he had just made. So we know that there is idle time when there is frustration or error rescue. So, but that was with the trainee. I have not gotten an opportunity to, to look at the experts when they're doing it. So you have behavioral data that differentiates novices from experts. Yes. What I'm wondering about is there are other kinds of data like neuroimaging data that you could collect while they're performing those tasks. Have you thought of doing that? I, I would love to do that. I mean, I haven't, I think that you're exactly right. I, the, 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 we are finding correlations with the metrics with conversation, with talk. So when we're collecting the audio data, we have another group that does um, processing of language language processing and clustering, and we're, we're seeing that where there's idle time with motion, sometimes there's more talking, and that means you're giving direction, uh, and 
that's a very different person than when there's idle time and there's no talking then you're really flustered and trying to figure out. So there are correlations with the idle time metric and other measures, but we have barely begun to scratch the surface with this. So we're excited about partnering and, and moving forward with this data. Over here, okay. Just there's two areas you, you didn't look at. Where surgery is one thing, but surgical pathology, its partner is also has a few dilemmas. One of them, that I recall quite succinctly was in radical neck dissections where you're required to get a certain number of lymph nodes, and you have to do that by palpating. And for a path pathology resident, they usually do a very dismal job, and that has to do with staging of a tumor, which is very important. The other is in bowel resections, and sometimes you get the, the lymph nodes are in the fat, and they're very difficult to get out. And it took me years before I could even get basically proficient in it Sometimes you have to cut through it and you get double lymph nodes. So this would be an area, I have no idea how you would study it, but if the big hospitals are still doing it manually, I know that some hospitals are just dissolving out the fat pads, the lymph nodes, just to save time, but if you're actually trying to palpate out lymph nodes in fat, that would be a good project for you to try to attack. Thank you very much. I, I am right there with you in the path, pathology lab looking at that specimen and even the same in the OR before I give it to you. It's the same. I'm trying to get my residents to feel the lymph nodes and palpation is definitely an art. Uh, they, they, what's interesting is that you can be trained and I think the only, the part that's missing is that we don't do the testing to see what your haptic skills are and if they are below that of those who are expert we don't do purposeful training because we're not testing folks yet but i think there's a huge opportunity to do that thank you thanks over here well <laughs> congratulations for looking at the kinetics of the surgical steps in different process as well as palpation techniques we are using so when i was at mayo clinic i developed techniques to measure arterial thrombus and I was using large animal models so we could collect the data and apply to FDA for clinical evaluation of platelet inhibitors in heart valves and coronary bypass graft. So every time I will have a new resident, I was always afraid because my animal could survive on the heart-lung machine for 60 minutes. And when a new resident comes, it takes such a long time to put the cannula in the aorta, sometimes they end up in rupturing, so that ends up in a much longer time. So I ended up losing the whole animal, almost for $5,000 worth of the study. So that reminded me that uh, <coughs> for a complex procedures of heart-lung machine operation, doing open heart surgery is much more complex, but you're looking at the individual step. So since you're a professor of surgery as well as in other areas, I was thinking of asking you why, in spite of the differences, why there are so few women in uh, surgical practice. Using your technique, you could train them better so there will be more women physicians in surgery. That is a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> I probably I'll have an answer that you weren't expecting. <laughs> I, I don't think that women, that I, I, women I don't think they don't go into surgery because they lack skill. Um, it, some of them, it's more a lifestyle decision, um, as well as men and women choose not to go into surgery for the same reasons, actually. Um, so I, I think it's more, more lifestyle as opposed to skill. Um, there has been a fair amount of research maybe 40 years ago looking at the differences between trying to look at the differences between the actual technical skill of female surgeons and male surgeons and the results shows that the females tend to be less confident in their skills but when you when you measure their performance it's no different but so that's have, a different uh, you have thing the data and the skill set probably you've got encourage them to participate more. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take two more questions. Yes. Um, it's very impressive. Thank you. Uh, so with the amount of data you're generating, is there an idea to teach a robot to do that instead of a human? Uh, I know the, I mean, the area of haptic, the touch, you know, technology for robots is rapidly developing. And it seems to me that 
maybe you can devise a perfect algorithm for you know, exam, like intubation or breast exam, and teach a robot to do that. Is there any work going on in this domain? There is, uh, and it's been interesting. Um, so there is a work uh, by one researcher that a, a number of researchers I've followed over the years, but one uh, that has made a particular next step in the advancement uh, of trying to design robot hands, and they really got into focusing on the sense of touch of the robot. So I, I, I think that, that there is something special about the sense of touch, and in my mind I have always thought that if we were really going to design the perfect robot, or a robot that even had capabilities that would be far and above human capabilities, we need to understand all that the expert human does exactly. first yeah. and then use that data to train the robot. And so we're back to the data again, but I think it's very promising and it's very exciting where we're headed. Last question. Hi, um, I'm Grace Peng, uh, Dr. Pugh's Program Officer for her PKS Award at NIBIB. And Thank at you. NIBIB, mm -hmm. we support a lot of new technology development, obviously. In one of your slides, you talked about um, the uh, danger of patient safety in terms of introducing new technologies into the operating room or the clinic. And I was just wondering if you can comment on what is the current practice for training um, practitioners on new technologies and is there an avenue there for simulator development as well? Thanks. That's a fantastic question. Um, I'm thoughtful. Uh, there are new technologies that get introduced every day. It's not even, not just in surgery. New defibrillators where they actually change where the knobs are. And then if you don't do in-service training of people, then you pull it out in the midst of an emergency and you're like, wow, everything has changed and, and there's lost time there. I think that um, what I've been excited about is that, it, again, it doesn't matter the technology or the technique we are always going to have to train healthcare professionals to be excellent. And then how do you train them to be excellent? You first have to define what excellence is, and if we can quantify that, then we will be ahead of the game more than what we've ever been in the healthcare profession. And so I find that exciting. Um, I think that simulation, again, has a number of different uses. It has uses for training. It has uses for testing. And I think it has use as a standardized laboratory bench for us to investigate how humans learn, how they think, and how they respond uh, to new technologies, unexpected situations, and then use that data for training. Um, I also, you know, I think that it can also help us to develop new technologies, to train robots to do things that human beings don't need to do anymore. I think it will actually help us evolve in terms of what we learn and what we do and how we partner in this constant balance between human skills and robot skills. So I think it's always about the data and I am very uh, excited about the things that are happening nationwide with the advances in sensors and data analytics. Thank you. So yeah, please let's thank our speaker again. Professor Pugh, that was marvelous. Please join us in the medical library uh, for refreshments and further conversation uh, with Professor Pugh. Thank you all. <laughs>